So I was a little bit of a fraud here, and I'm not really talking too much about crowds, um, but about asymptotes and, and fretting problems. In, in the first one of these, that was in Pawnee, I had just done a PhD by John Scalarud, which was kind of notch uh, crack problem, initiation of cracks from notches. And the candidate has insisted that it was definitely mode one dominated. There wasn't any clear reason why this was. So this led me to look at the, um, the Williams solution. And if you remember, you know, there are two terms. There's an anti-symmetric term, mode one term, and mode two. And they're both square and singular for a crack. But in notch problems, the mode one dominates the mode two. So I looked for the internal length dimension in this and, re and replaced the K1 and the K2 with these other two parameters, D0 and G. And then you can see that D0, which is just this ratio of the K2 to K1, becomes effectively the boundary um, between K1 and K2 regions. Then in Malaga, uh, I talked about how we could um, use this idea for studying the possible or quantifying the nucleation of the starting tracks in the corner of a complete contact. So this is meant to be the contact corner here. This is the body that it's stuck to. And uh, if you can fit a notch asymptote into this little region here. And I spend a lot of effort looking at the internal properties of this so that uh, if you zoom right in, you get a big smoke field. You can see these are the crack fronts. The plasticity fronts for increasing uh, magnitude of load. You zoom in and it looks more like mode one, and you zoom in again and it looks increasingly like mode one. So these really were uh, attempts to quantify what the, what, the, what, the problem, what the solution looked like internally. And then you eventually just turn this to 45 degrees and you can fit it into the corner of the contact. Um, here, here, for example, here, here's the size of the plastic front along what will be the interface line as a function of the magnitude of the load. But really, I, I'm not sure that any of that was really needed. What I'm really doing all this for is to try and understand, try and find a, a set of criteria, a set of conditions to quantify the nucleation of cracks under fretting conditions. And I claim that there are only four times of cost of contact. If you, if you can think of others, let me know. So there's convex ones, like a Hertzian contact, where the contact pressure is square root bounded at the edge. There's complete ones, which is what I'm really supposed to be talking about now, where the power order is singular. There are receding ones, which, when it's snapped, reduce shape or again um, square root bounded. And there are contacts formed by two bodies at the same, at the same time. Um, now, if we think about the different kinds of nucleation you can get, you can get freely nucleated cracks on, 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 on plane fatigue on, on three surfaces, and I don't think there's much we can do to quantify that very rigorously from a scientific point of view. There are cracks which start from internal points with four studies, and Professor Hong was talking about this morning. And then there's these cracks which start from the corner of a contact. And because it's always the corner, it means that we can use an asymptote to very good effect. So here are some examples of uh, complete contacts in practice. Um, one that really does occur a lot that uh, made us start analysing all this was this spline contact that you get. Um, and this is a, a photograph of two of a coupling between two shafts in a gas turbine, Rolls-Royce gas turbine. Um, and you can see we're uh, serious with deep value here. Um, so other kinds of contact you can get, of course, uh, this is a fan blade, you can get incomplete uh, contacts here. The harder you pull, the bigger the contact becomes. Uh, here's a, 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 a crack. And uh, our way of analysing this experimentally in the lab has always been initially to try and simulate what happens in practice. So this is a very complicated apparatus which David, my colleague, the other David, developed uh, 15 years ago with, um, with Carlos Ruiz, and which is meant to mimic the conditions very closely in the engine. But the problem with this, from my angle of is that it does not reveal the material property. It simply simulates what happens in the prototype. But what I want to try and do is to seek um, a, a material property so that we can do, discover that in the lab and then apply it to any complicated prototypical problem. 
So the apparatus um, is this thing here, tensile test specimen in the middle, pair of pads which are clamped onto the specimen um, by a constant load in which are shuffled up and down under controlled conditions. And we can make these pads such that we can either make them an incomplete contact or we can make it a complete contact. Um, another piece of apparatus designed to do a similar thing um, was designed and built and used extensively by our friend Arthur Lecovara, and he simply sandwiched the tensile specimen between two pads and then wiggled the end of the cantilever up and up and down. So at these points here, at the root of the cantilever, you get something that's very notch-like, and therefore you could put an asymptote to it of the kind that I've been describing earlier on. Now he didn't do that, he got some notional SN curves, which uh, obviously end in the usual direction S up here, where the S value we used, the stress, was simply that implied by the theorem. Obviously there's nothing like that kind of thing there, it was really a, a, a notch. So simply by fitting a notch to it, you can turn that into a K, N curve, which then represents the life of the thing. I mean, you're neglecting crack propagation, you're assuming that all of the life is consumed in crack nucleation, but this becomes, for that particular material, something with a distinct threshold, so that below that you would expect not to nucleate a crack, if you're above that, then this gives you the number of cycles to nucleate. Oh, no, we've got plenty of time, okay. So, that's as far as the story goes with complete contacts. What about incomplete contacts? Now, I know that's not the subject of this symposium, but bear with me. If you have an incomplete contact, you need to start again with your asymptote. So the contact pressure at the edge of the contact will fall um, a square root bounded weight to zero. But if you put shear forces and tensions in, if you assume to start off with that the contact is fully stuck, then what happens is that the shear fraction here is square root singular. So, that actually, that part of the field is very similar to what you get in a notch. Now, not using notch theory, but using half plane theory, we can again find a local solution to the state of stress. I'm not going to go into that because it's not relevant here. When David came to do his DPL nearly 20, well, 25 years ago, he did more than a hundred um, fretting experiments with incomplete contacts. And one of the things he was trying to investigate was the effect of the size of the contact. He found that for a given state of stress, big contacts much more readily nucleated the contact than small ones. Okay. So if you neglect the size effect, you simply have an S anchor, and here's the S and the N. Then the results of this result of this test on a, on its four percent copper aluminium. Uh, look like a cloud, just like, like the sky at night. So you've got runouts here of this stress level um, and finite failures, a finite number of cycles in which those stress. <coughs> but that same set of data, if you fit the asymptote, gives you an S anchor that looks like this. Now of course it's noisy here, and the reason it's noisy is because this incorporates uh, tests from all different sizes and we're neglecting the propagation phase. But it, apart from that, it's pretty clean. Okay. And one last thing, which has got nothing at all to do with uh, notches, but I hope you're going to, um, I'll try and seduce you to do move it, to work in contacts in, in, instead. Um, if you have a, a square block of material pressed onto something which is made of the same material, but instead of just pushing it down, you now slide it along, the following happens. You do a finite element analysis, and if there's no friction, the contact pressure, of course, is symmetrical, and it's this line here. You now increase the friction, and what happens is that the contact becomes increasingly singular at the leading edge, and at the trailing edge, it drops off until eventually it actually looks like it separates and becomes bounded. It's exactly what does happen. You can do something very close to a Williams analysis for this kind of problem, but incorporating the effects of friction. And the key parameters come out of that, the eigenvalue, is the exponent 
that tells you about how the pressure varies with position from the edge of the contact. And that's what's on this axis here, if you look at this graph at the side. The coefficient of friction is on the horizontal axis, and zero friction is in the middle. So we've got friction going that way and that way. And the reason it goes both ways on the ground is because you've got two kinds of edge. You've got edges which are leading and moving like that, and edges which are trailing, uh, what, uh, like that. Yeah. Now, the key, the thing which controls it is the strongest, the dominant eigenvalue, the most negative eigenvalue. And at the leading edge, as the coefficient of friction increases, the value of lambda decreases, it becomes <coughs> increasingly singular. At the trailing edge, as the co coefficient of friction increases, the lambda value increases. Until at the magic coefficient of friction of 1 over pi, it changes from being singular to being bounded. And then at the coefficient of friction of 0.4, just under 0.4, it becomes complex when the contact separates. And that's exactly what we find at the strain the edge. So what this tells you is that in this kind of problem, no matter how hard you push down the trailing edge of the contact, you can't keep it in intimate contact. It must separate. Uh, I, I know that this is a side issue, but I'm really trying to say that in this class of contact problem as well, um, asymptotes like the ones that we use in notches are extremely valuable. So just to conclude, not all contacts, but two very major classes are complete and incomplete. And from each of those, we can put together a very well-defined set of asymptotic forms. And in particular, for each of them, there is one, an oscillatory one, which actually controls, seems to control, experimentally verified the length of time it takes to nucleate a crack. Um, there's a long way to go in this yet, um, but it's a start to producing a quantifiable way uh, of, of uh, working out how uh, consistent theory the nucleation cracks uh, on the contact properties. That's all I've got to say.